Hello, and welcome to The Resource, the podcast propelling employer brands to recruit smarter and retain better. I'm your host, Priscilla Peters. And I'm your other host, Scott Dismuke. Priscilla, you have survived another recruiting and retention conference. Yes. Finished it up a couple weeks ago when we're recording this. How'd it go? It went great. We, we had a great time. We had great attendees, great sponsors. I mean, the feedback that we've gotten has been been really, really good. I'm excited about how it went. We're kind of putting a bow on it right now. You know, you got to tie up all the fun loose ends. But listen, we had a really successful event. I know that, um, honestly, there was a lot of talk about technology and data and all the things that are kind of right up our alley. But you had a chance to kind of talk to some folks while we were there. And that's really what this episode's all about, right? Yeah, I did. So so we did this episode a little differently. Um, so so Priscilla, for those of you that don't know, pretty much runs and manages the R&R conference. So she was completely tied up actually doing work <laughs> while some of us were attending the conference, having, you know, having a good time. So what we were able to do for this episode that we're going to play you is we were able to sit down with several people and do some short interviews uh, just to kind of get a variety of of topics covered and get feedback and just listen to some folks talk about recruiting and retention and some technologies and podcasts and try to cover the whole gamut. So so unfortunately for this episode, you're going to be stuck with me interviewing these people. And And I told Priscilla when we were talking about this, it was really weird kind of starting out because I'm used to us feeding off of one another when we do these episodes. And so to have to go in and interview these people completely alone, I, I felt, uh, you know, I was a little lonely. I, Priscilla, I did. I, I missed you. No, you'll probably be like, I'm solo now. Like now I can just take this on the road and be so. <laughs> well, let's see. Well, let's see what the feedback is before we start patting, you know, patting people on the back. But I did. It was, it was weird having to kind of fly solo on this. So so this episode really is we're going to play several interviews for you that we did, kind of some short 10, 15, 20 minute interviews, uh, just to kind of give you a variety of some of the things that we covered. And I'll, I'll just kind of piggyback on what Priscilla said. If you've never been to the R&R conference, you got to go. It's it's a great conference. Uh, there's so much information that that is able to to be learned at this conference. So w- when we talk about it next year, make sure you sign up and go. Priscilla and the team at Conversion does a fantastic job of putting this together, and uh, it's definitely worth your time. And you get to come to Nashville, so uh, that's that's pretty good. So we'll play these uh, short interviews for you. Uh, take a listen. Uh, we hope you en- enjoy it because there's some good information here. All right, everybody. First guest at the annual R and R is going to be our good friend Lauren Fernell. Lori, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome. So let me give you everybody a little background. So Lori is the president of Truck Drivers USA and Drivers Got Jobs. She has 34 years of experience, which means you started at age 12. 12 and a half. 12 and a half. Uh, in the transportation industry and works for both fleets on the advertising and has worked for fleets on both advertising and marketing side. She has spent 20 years working with trucking companies in the talent and acquisition uh, space and 14 years with an ad agency that specializes in driver recruitment marketing. So usually we start all of our guests off with what we call the first five. So since this is a little different and we're interviewing a lot of folks, I'm not going to put you through the first five, but I am going to ask you at least one question okay. to uh, just kind of break the ice here. So what is the most used app on your phone? Oh, truthfully? Well, preferably. <laughs> TikTok. Okay. Hey, there's nothing wrong with Follow that. Follow a close second behind Pinterest. Pinterest is probably, I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah, so I've never done the Pinterest. Um, I've done, I, I guess, I did the TikTok whole quite a bit. Uh-huh. And it's it's a hole. Yeah, it's you a get hole. in there and you just keep going. And yeah, keep going. So, all right. So, tell us a little bit first about Truck Drivers USA. What do you guys do? Truck Drivers USA is basically think of it as Match.com. Okay. We find um, drivers, we pull them into our system, and we look at what they're looking for and their criteria, and then we work with um, carriers and we match them based on what their criteria is, and we do it all within like thirty six. So it's a very relevant, it's a driver looking for a job. We match them very quickly.
quickly with the carrier and the carrier is able to do, we do some lead nurturing with it, do some other things, but, but that's essentially um, the beauty of what we do. Yeah. We, try to, we supply pre qualified leads. That's fantastic. So, yeah. so part of this, as I understand, is you're building online communities. Is that oh, accurate? Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's the secret. Just to give you an idea, um, we, we have just on Facebook alone over a million followers, but here's the cool thing. We do the greatest content. I'm a big proponent for the image of the driver. Okay. So we do all this really cool content. The drivers are really engaged. Uh, last two months ago, I had one post that hit 70 million. 70 million. Wow. I mean, crazy. Um, and they just love what we're doing, and they're sharing it, and, and those friends are yeah. sharing it, and sharing it. I mean, heck, it showed up on my 84-year-old mom's Facebook. Oh, fantastic. So it just kind of hit everybody. So so maybe for our folks that are listening, what advice would you have for people when it comes to uh, building online communities? First off, you know, what I, I've been on the carrier side trying to build a community. And on the carrier side, we do a lot of serious stuff, very serious training stuff. And we, we didn't show our human side. And what I'm finding is drivers want that human side. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, um, so on, on social, anything that we can show that, that has a little bit of humor. Um, and you can do humor and still be respectful. You can do humor and still be classy, right? But anything with a little bit of humor, anything that is educational, they thrive for that education. Anything's going to help you know more, do more, be better. Um, I even found on Facebook, I mean, on, on LinkedIn, we, we, our target on LinkedIn, obviously, is for our customers. And when we post something that's either very personal, like a birthday message from one of our associates or um, something about her children, or we post, post something with a little bit of humor, we get far greater response, far greater engagement than just sharing some article, you know. That's um, interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so funny, serious, just something showing the human side. Is it usually funny that gets the most... Kind of response you know, or the, the, the one here the one that got the 70 million was literally a picture of the interstate and had an arrow pointing to lane one and said this lane you go fast and pass lane two this lane you go the speed limit and lane three this lane you go under the speed limit that's literally all so it wasn't funny but it hit every one of us understand oh, the frustration involved and people right. driving in the wrong lane and you're not both driven in arkansas <laughs> yeah where that that left lane gets super it's well, it does, yeah. but the bad thing is, in defense of our our friends that are driving a truck, is that it's seventy five in Arkansas, but set, uh, truckers can only go seventy. Absolutely. So when they get over in that left lane to pass, they don't have a choice, right. and it slows everybody down. So, yeah, so they get trouble. they certainly get a pass on that. So, so I understand you have a a brand new site for Final Mile yes. drivers. Yes. Okay? So excited. So kind of maybe talk about that a little bit. And then talk about maybe what is the secret sauce on the final mile drivers. Oh, great. So we have a site called driver.jobs. Mm -hmm. So on, on driver.jobs, it's it's really geared towards that driver that wants to run local, okay. um, regional. Uh, our, and it's everything from I'm a class A driver that's local, regional, dedicated, to I pull up a drive straight truck, to I'm in my own car delivering um, as a courier. So it covers that whole gamut. If you're a driver and you want a job driving something, um, we have a place for you. And it's, I'm finding, you know, when I, we did the research before we started this, it was really interesting to see that companies spend 53% of their shipping costs for dog gear for this final mile. Really? Yeah. So they're, and, and, and notice in your, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I think grocery delivery is often as a game. Oh, you know, yes. and so we've become the society that that's, you know, during COVID, that's what some of our drivers came off the road and that's what they had yeah. to do, right? So um, we're finding more and more need. I know when I started in trekking, a long haul truck driver drove 1,500 miles. By the time I got out of working for a long haul trucking company, the average haul was 615 miles. Mm -hmm. Now I'm here to say it's, it's much below that, but we're seeing that, that length of haul. And, and it's because drivers are demanding. Uh, and rightfully so, a better um, work-life balance, yep. you know, and, and, and shortening those calls and, and, and changing how we do things is allowing them to do that. So, so Very excited. Um, secret sauce, same kind of thing. You you come into the system. You you, t you tell us about yourself. We match you with the company. We, we find the company and connect you two together, and it's a win-win for everybody. That's fantastic. So, 
So let everybody know how they can find you on the web or yes. on Facebook. Let everybody know how they can find you and if they want to reach out to you about seeing how, how they can uh, you can help. So we're truck drivers with plural truckdriversus.com. You can find us on the site from there. You'll see all the links to all our social channels. We're on all the channels. And then drivers.jobs. And again, you can find us on all those on all of our channels. That's fantastic. Well, I definitely want to make sure we have you back on on a full episode. Oh. We can really dive into this. Priscilla will be here. She's much more exciting than I am and probably a little more entertaining. I've got a few tracking I, stories I can share too. I'm all, I'm all in for that. So really appreciate you stopping Thank by. You. Have a great time this week. Yes. And we'll talk to you soon. Good deal. Thank you. All right, everybody. I, this is the interview that I've been looking forward to the most. And, and I, as I introduce him to you, I'm literally going to do it as he sent it to me in this bio because nothing will explain our good friend Matt Beach better than the bio he sent me. So here we go. That was not written, written at all. This is pure. I, I wrote this. Oh. This is not ChatGPT. This is me. Okay. All right. So here we go. Matt Beach is the master of multitasking and a legend in the driver recruiting sector. I uh, mean, legends a little too much. I like it. I'm, uh, we go with it. By day, he is the president of 10 4 Recruiting, True. reeling in qualified driver candidates for 10 4's amazing clients. <laughs> but when the sun sets, you'll find him knee deep in a trout stream. Yes. Casting lines and swapping tails with the fish about the ones that got away. On weekends, Beach transforms into a riverboat gambler, navigating the high seas of chance with a poker face that could rival Mount Rushmore. Between hands, he's planning his next turkey or deer hunting excursion, blending seamlessly into the wilderness like a ninja in camo. Now, when he sent that to me, he said I could change whatever I want. Anything you did. I didn't change a thing because here's what I told him. This bio is a lot like a Bob Ross painting. It's, it's timeless. It's majestic. And is not to be messed with. I love it. So that is the Bob Ross painting. So there's a challenge. I was going to see if you would change it and it would have an issue. But, uh, I appreciate you keeping it on <laughs> to the more. I wasn't going to change the thing. So, yeah. so here's the other thing. We normally have on our podcast what we call our first five. Okay. And our first five are serious <laughs> questions that seriously don't matter. We're not asking all of the five questions on this, but there's a question on here that I absolutely wanted to ask you. So we're going to start with that. And that is, what is one talent that you have that only those close to you know about? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, this is, this is, uh, yeah, 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 you're, you're right. right. You're yeah, right. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so I, went, I went that route. <laughs> I can do. Without it, I, it, it depends because I'm drinking. I'm drinking this, and it's not my flavor <laughs> by no means. But at the same time, I can do a turkey call. All right. Without having an actual call in my mouth, just natural. Okay. It's not great, but it, it, it's it's good. Enough. All right. You know what a turkey call sounds like? I know exactly what a turkey call sounds like. Let's try. It. <laughs> yeah. No, that, wow. Not, come on. That, that's that, good. that is not good. I went turkey. You put me on the spot. You put me on the spot. Nice. Well, it's far better than what I do. You know, these acoustics are wrong. You put me on the spot. I'm feeling nervous. I, so I so went. that Step Brothers. I went turkey hunting one time. How'd you do? Um, I fell asleep. I'm a duck hunter. I prefer to duck hunt. Well, in duck hunt, you fall asleep too. It, no, I actually don't. I don't fall asleep when I duck hunt. But I have to be quiet when I turkey hunt. I don't have to be quiet when I duck hunt. So I've done a lot of hunting different types. Duck hunting is the one I've never done. Okay. I've never done duck hunting before. Never. So duck hunting is right up your alley. Oh, I love it. You know, so so I have to be, I'm a social hunter, mm -hmm. right? The other great thing about duck hunting. Social I mean, you like to talk. Yeah, I don't, don't, don't want to have to be quiet. If I'm going to get up there. You don't have to be, well, you have to be quiet, but you can actually stop. You're not just, yeah, like the, I'm not sitting listen, in one spot. And, I'm finding the birds. I'm okay. finding where they're at. The duck um, hunting, you sit in a blind with six or seven of your buddies. And... All you do is just watch for ducks before you call them in, but in between there, you're socializing, as we would say. So I, 
And here's, but here's the thing. I don't, I've been duck hunting numerous times. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I've ever shot a duck. I've shot at a duck. You never killed a duck. I don't know. Because what yeah, happens is they, when they, when they, they come in to land, everybody pops out of the blind and fires off three shots. If you got eight guys, it's 24 so shots. Have, yeah, one time. Have no I have no idea. Now, in a, when you're in a duck blind, what are things you don't say? <laughs> There's got to be a list. Of things you don't say? Yeah. There's got to be a list. Like, we're, I mean, we're, like what, if, what if we're in a blind? I go, I hear Mariah Carey's making her duck. Well, you can say that. But you wouldn't want to. No. With no chance. No, no, no. No, you wouldn't want to say that. I, or, guys, I think the keys are somewhere between here and the truck. That's, <laughs> yeah, because you're probably somewhere in the middle of the field. I will tell you, here's, here's what I hey, told you. Is it okay if I shoot the mud up in my barrel? <laughs> here's, here's, what I, here's, what, here's what I told my son, and then we'll have to get to it because Priscilla's going to get on me for not staying on the track uh, with her not here. So, so, first time we went, I took my son. He was 13 years old. First time I took him duck hunting. And I told him, I said, all right. Here's the rule. What's said in the duck line stays in the duck line. Is it real? It did with him. If he wanted to go back, he wanted to go back. It did. It sure did. Now that was several years ago. So, all right, we need what? We need to have you on again. We have five questions in the full thing. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Just the just one of the first five. Because if if I ask you the first five, it's a whole episode. Give me one more. Give me one more. What's another one? Um, What did you have? What is the best sandwich? Oh, it's BLT. Hands down. No mayonnaise, mustard, all lean, bacon, less than tomato. Toasted. Top toasted. toasted. It has to be toasted. White bread. We white bread. bread. Yep. White bread. Old man sandwich is what I call it. I can mm-hmm. eat those all day long. All right. Breakfast, so, lunch, and dinner. Can't beat it. Is a hot dog a sandwich? What? A hot dog a sandwich. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. It's not. Okay. How do you define a sandwich? I mean, we're going to go Two, pieces of, two, pieces, two of pieces of flat Two pieces of flat bread. Two pieces of bread. bread. Two, two pieces of bread. Okay. All right. So we'll have you on. We'll ask you the first all five of the first five. Okay. Got to have you full. Well, so, so all right. So let's let's get down to business here. So sure. tell us a little bit about Ten Four Recruiting. What do you do? The whole nine yards. Ten Four Recruiting is just your standard third party recruiting. So back in, oh gosh, I, I know I'm probably saying it wrong, but maybe I think it was 2020 when um, I kicked around the idea. It was kind of in the middle of COVID and. I've always stayed close with the truck hunting schools. You know, so at that point, I was like, okay, they're, they're shutting down. We're fixing to have what I call like, it. Was, it was a true shortage. I mean, mm-hmm. you're not actually, people are not going into the industry. Excuse me. And so I thought, you know, see a need filling it, right? And this could be a good opportunity. So it started uh, in November. Uh, I remember I had two people. When I first, I mean, within the first uh, month, I had two people, two recruiting going on. And one of them is still with me to this day. He's my recruiting man. Does a great job. But uh, I had started it, brought them on, and brought on uh, two large carriers at the time. And then I got COVID. And then it was mm-hmm. to the point where that was, it, was the, it was the real deal type stuff. And one of them called me and said, Are, are you going to, I mean, I can remember vividly him saying this that, are you going to die? <laughs> He's like, I just didn't know. I didn't know about the job. What's going on? And we came out and, you know, it was very blunt. And so we, it was, we started off with the standard third part. And which is, you know, flat cost I, I want a car, two street leads, and um, for, for whatever lines we have open. And then we push that full application to the recruitment. The carrier work up be a standard department. Be hired on, right? Be then I had a carrier call me and say, Man, I'm down people. Well, can you help me? I need some recruiting for you. Know, like, can you do this? And I was like, yep. I know it. I know. <laughs> it's like, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. And that's what we did. And so we offer um, those two buckets. You know, okay. we, have the standard department. we have the, hey, I'm hurting, or you know, I'm, I'm down with these mm-hmm. stuff, or yes, staffing times. Yeah, ten, ten pages, yeah. right? But it, both of them's been um, been really good. I mean, it's it's um, in a sense that we can we can almost we can do it all. Mm-hmm. You know? And so they bring me in. They're like, "Hey, what about? Can you help us out with recruiting training? Can you help us out with you know some other consultants? Can you do their party? Can you?" I mean, it yes. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like we said, you learn as you go. And so we've uh, it's it's been a blessing. That's it's awesome. A blessing. Yeah. So you said a couple of things. I want to touch on that? So you, you talked about being connected with schools, and I know you're on the board of the. Commercial vehicle um, uh, training association. Training association. Yeah. Thank you much. 
So let's talk about that a little bit. So maybe what challenges do you see? Because a lot of folks that are listening are, are recruiting retention folks. So what challenges do you see for new drivers coming in the industry right now? Well, first of all, the, the Commercial Vehicle Training Association, if any carrier in the United States, if they have a student program or an entry-level driver training program, they must be connected to the CBTA. There's, there's no advantage especially from a legislation standpoint, you've got, you know, in even schools themselves, because if there's school owners that are listening to this and going, I'm stuck in the state because of they're holding me back on training or third party testing, whatever, the CBTA has the connections to be able to help address those issues. And plus with the CBTA, you have, it's the largest privately, or largest organization of private, privately owned truck driving schools. So, so some of the largest in the nation are part of the CBTA. So you can think from a networking standpoint, you have truck driving schools along with large carriers. I mean, the, the relationships alone and the connections are phenomenal. And so it's always been one of my favorite organizations to be part of. Very passionate about helping drivers come into the, into the uh, trucking industry. Now, your question is, what's the challenges? Challenge, yeah, for, for newer drivers. Well, even right now, I mean, it's... For challenges for drivers and even for schools themselves is and we've seen a lot of uh, some pullback with how many students are being brought into those carriers and so here some schools are our students are looking for jobs mm -hmm. right now it'll, it'll get there it's yeah. going to pick up it's going to happen but so you think now. that's economic related yeah it is. it's totally it's just like hey, we just don't have the team break we don't have this break we don't have this right here we can't cut because we need the experience driver yeah. not a trainer and so, but that's going to be better. It, it, it definitely is. And but the schools themselves are doing a fantastic job of being able to find placements for those. So I mean, they're really having to you know like find some other key relationships right. with other carriers and other local in, uh, individual uh, companies that hire those mm -hmm. those tra for apprenticeship training, whatever. Um, but the challenges themselves. I mean, it's I don't know if there's a challenge of people coming in. to me. It's it's a fantastic industry yeah. to get into. So how do we, that there's always a need for a driver. Yeah. So how do we, because it's not a secret in trucking that our workforce is aging. Mm -hmm. How do we attract maybe some from the younger generation? You know, we saw during COVID, you know, truckers really got their due as they should have during yeah. COVID. It was all about nurses and truck drivers during COVID. So how do we maybe maintain that momentum and attract younger drivers into the industry. Yeah, so I'm doing a uh, breakout session with Lindsey Trent and Priscilla Davis. Uh, Lindsey Trent with the Next Generation Truck Drivers and uh, Priscilla Davis, she is a co-owner of a truck driving school here in Nashville. Okay. And that was the question of what are the next generation or the, the those type drivers, what what can the younger generation, what is it that they can do to entice them to come to the industry or while they're in it? How do you, how do you keep them in there? Yeah. You know, a lot of it is, or if you're going to take some of some of the thunder one, but um, you know, more so that still keep a strong relationship. Mm -hmm. Always communi communication has always been key. Yep. Um, some of I think there was a mention of why well, phone the trucks. I mean, it's amazing how some of that like that that goes a long way, especially when they're in the bunk going, "What oh, do right?" And so there's that pay is a huge one. I mean, pay, 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 pay's got to be competitive. Yeah. You know, because especially right now, I mean, think about which again a challenge, but mm -hmm. with the way cost of living is. Yeah. Um, benefits are huge right now. That you know, am I going to be able to have health benefits or whatever? Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I didn't think about four hundred one k at that no. age. I wasn't at all. No. But now we've been trying to push, push, save, 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 and so all those and there's there's much much more of just that you know of uh, those those younger individuals coming to the industry of just you know again this. Just be open. They honest have a phenomenal communication versus just putting the truck and making the number. Yeah. All trucks want to do that, especially this younger generation. Make communications key. Yeah. No, I mean, we see that in our data all the time. So so real quick, uh, kind of last question to finish up here. So what what advice would you have for carriers? Because I know you spend a lot of time in, in recruiting and and things things like that. So in particularly for 2024 as it relates to carriers. How? What advice would you have for them navigating their ATS? Oh gosh, well, it, it's it's train, train, train. Use that tool and challenge whatever ATS you're using. Um, find out ways of how can this ATS help me hire the most drivers at the GPS policy. 
a lot of people don't think that. Like their ATS is just a it goes in the lead and I gotta make a phone call to it. It's a sales tool. And utilize it as a sales tool. Get your statuses where they need reporting, 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 which is data, data, data. How are you going to get that? Your ATS can do that for the most part. Most ATSs can provide you the data you need. And it's amazing. Curious don't realize that. Or it's just so comfortable. We're going to click, what about this? What about this? What about this? And so take some time to sit down with the ATS people and say, how do I A, make this? Better for me, for my team. How do I make it to where it helps me hire more drivers at the cheapest cost? How do I organize it for my team? How do I make this an actual sales tool? Because it is. It, it's just a lot of care, just not utilizing it that way. And it should be. But the big thing for me is data, 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 reporting, reporting, reporting. And all that goes back to is making sure your recruiters are trained on it properly, utilizing you have statuses that are defined accordingly as to what each one means, and tagging, 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 tagging. Tag. Awesome, man. Well, hey, really appreciate your time. Are you, are you getting teary I'm, I'm, I'm getting teary eyed. I'm like chugging up I'm, 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 I'm declimped. Uh, it's been, I've been looking forward to this for, for weeks. Yeah, um, for like 15 minutes. I'm not going to get out. I'll get you now. I've had it all up for well, three. I've been three hours. I can, I can talk for three Oh, well, listen. I, I can talk for We need to talk. We, we can make the LC sandwiches. We, we, go. we need to talk hunting stories, but we may need to check the rating on that one because I can tell something about story so but appreciate your time have yep. a great conference man we will see you soon and we'll definitely have you on for a full hour next time appreciate you all right, all right. Yeah. so our next guest is grant harold grant is coming with uh to us from market scale based out of dallas yes um you're actually going to be one of the uh, on one of the panels tomorrow in one of the main sessions so looking forward to that but you are the head of transportation and mobility for market scale and you are the host of the acclaimed transportation mobility focused video podcast series, Are We There Yet? Yes. Where he speaks with individuals and companies defining the cutting edge of technology shaping the way we move around, Grant. Yeah. It's great to have you in Nashville. It's great to have you at the conference and uh, appreciate you giving us some time today. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here and, and what a great city. Uh, you've got a, a special city here in Nashville. So um, I always have a lot of fun when I get out here. So really, really great to be here. Excited for the big event. Here we yeah. go. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So tell yeah. us a little bit about your background, yeah. market scale, and, and maybe more importantly, um, your podcast for, yeah. for our listeners. Sure. Absolutely. So uh, really proud as you share to serve as the, uh, the head of transportation mobility at market scale. Uh, market scale and an incredible organization. Really, we work within a mission to, to really engage and activate the communities that are most important to the clients that we support. And a lot of that engagement, as we all know uh, nowadays, happens to be online. And uh, videos and podcast series and going live are such uh, great tools, you know, to really engage those communities out there nowadays. And so we really help companies to, to make that very easy and kind of turn everyone in their organizations uh, into ambassadors uh, to really get them a part of kind of that brand building, um, uh, content creation, kind of decentralizing uh, their content creation. So we, we love to do that, and, and we really are a tool and a platform that makes that very, very easy and effective for companies um, nowadays to do. And so we, we uh, support clients in about 16 different industries, so about every industry you can think of. And so, you know, everything from healthcare to professional uh, audio, uh, video, retail, and uh, I really enjoy my focus on the transportation mobility. Side of things, and so um, mobility nowadays. You know what used to be uh, trains, planes, and automobiles is is drones and robots and space travel and autonomous trucking and all the amazing stuff. So I really enjoy um, you know working with that vertical, supporting clients you know in that space yeah. and have a lot of fun doing that. And as you shared too, also uh, really enjoy hosting the Are We There Yet video podcast series as well. And uh, it's a fun series, and uh, I've had the series up for. Uh, almost two years now. Yeah, yeah. I noticed you were two seasons. Yeah, and, and one of the things I like yeah. about in, in doing a little research is yes. you don't just talk just about trucking. I mean, right. it is all kind of modes of transportation. I've yeah. seen stuff about rockets and yeah. and trucks and airplanes. I mean, yes. it kind of covers everything, right? It really does. It really does. And and that was really really our goal, I think, for the series. You know, when we think transportation mobility today, as I shared, it's more than just you know automotive. It's more than just you know trucks and trains and airplanes and things that we associate kind of with traditional transportation it's all this other really cool stuff that's happening as, as you shared you know that the space industry is such a fun 
uh, industry nowadays. You've got these incredible private organizations that are, you know, launching rockets, you know, into orbit. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. And, um, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to speak uh, uh, with a, a, a retired uh, NASA astronaut, uh, in fact, and, and CEO of an incredible organization um, that uses recycled thermoplastics as the fuel uh, for launching satellites. And so they uh, recycled water bottles and turned that into rocket fuel. So, you know, really fascinating stuff like that. And and, and for me, the podcast is pretty simple. I, I bring leaders uh, such as yourself onto the series and, and quite simply, I ask, are we there yet in terms of the stuff that they're working on? And so whether it's using recycled uh, plastic water bottles to launch satellites into space, um, whether it's, you know, enterprise level organizations, you know, the Cisco, Honeywell, Shell, John Deere's of the world. I enjoy talking with them and then I enjoy having a lot of fun too, learning about some of this really cool cutting edge stuff like the Rocket Company, um, uh, a really cool company uh, that is uh, revolutionizing kind of shipping and logistics and using tubes to uh, move products and eventually our goods. And so this idea, you know, we all love Prime next day, same day shipping is cool, yeah. but how about ordering something online and getting it in? 10 or 15 minutes, yeah. you know, that'll soon be a reality. So as, as you shared, you know, it's a fun space. It's, it's a lot of different industries. And I think the thing that kind of brings it all together is let's just talk about the cool stuff that you're working on. So, so, so I got to know just yeah. out of curiosity, because I've yeah. thought about just on a whim trying it for, for the resource. Yes. Have you tried to get Elon Musk? I, he is on my list. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and, and if Elon Musk is listening, which you very may well be to your incredible series uh, today, <laughs> Um, please uh, come on. Are we there yet? I'd, I'd love to ask uh, you know him a couple of are we there yet questions about all that he's doing right now within space and within Tesla and, and all the exactly. Well, that's what I was saying. Maybe we yes. figure out a joint way. Yes, to yes. Do a joint podcast. Yes. Full court press on Elon Musk. Let's do it. And talk about space. Yes. He can talk about electric trucks. I that's mean, right. We can just. It'd be a great conversation. Absolutely. He's in, he's now, what, he's in Texas now. He is. Right? He is. Absolutely. So you kind of got a home court event. Down the road. I Elon do. Musk, if you're yes. listening, yeah. we're, we're going to come. We're going to try to get you on. So. Yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so, so let's talk cutting edge technologies yeah. in, in trucking. Yes. So lots of talk right yeah. now about autonomous trucks. Yep. Uh, it's been discussed more and more. Yep. So maybe how close do you think we are as an yeah. industry yeah. Um, to having autonomous trucks being more prevalent on the road? Yeah, great question. Great, great are we there yet question. Uh, I, I love it. And I think autonomous trucking, as you shared, is one of the most exciting spaces you know, right now in all of transportation and mobility, right? This idea of, of, of 18 wheeler trucks uh, delivering uh, the goods that are so important to us. I mean, I, I really view trucking as kind of a backbone of the world and, and especially of America and just, uh, you know, empowering our, our everyday lives. And so this idea of moving towards autonomy within trucking, I, I think is very exciting. Um, to, to kind of answer the question or move towards getting there, how close are we getting there? Are we there yet in terms of automotive uh, autonomous trucking? Um, the answer is, is we are very, very close. I think my formal answer would be, are we there yet? Almost. Um, and, and how close are we? Well, we're so close that in Texas today, for example, you have um, some of the leaders within the industry, companies um, like Kodiak, for example, and Aurora, um, uh, that are moving towards autonomy and, and right now are on missions to have completely fully autonomous vehicles um, with no observer driver, for example, um, by the end of this year. So that's how close we are. So we're, you know, Mid-February, you know, right now, by the end of the year, into December, I, I think that we'll see fully autonomous trucks on the road, um, you know, in, in Texas, as an example. And, and, and I can say, for me, you know, living in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I, I've seen already, I have to say, um, you know, a couple of Kodiak trucks, for example, um, you know, moving towards autonomy with the observer drivers, of course, you know, but I, I've seen them on the highway already today. So that, that's how close yeah. we are. Yeah. So, so you think, because yeah. I, I've often thought about yeah. the autonomous trucks, yeah. and I thought, well, if we ever get to that as an industry, it'll be a lot like when we fly on a plane. Mm -hmm. So we have an mm -hmm. autopilot, yes. but there's always a pilot. Yeah. Do you think it'll actually be to where there won't be anybody in the cab, not even a, not even a safety driver? I, I do. I, I, I think, I, yes, I think it will reach that point for sure. Um, and I think we'll gradually get there. Um, I, I know that all of these organizations, the, the, the technology providers, you know, um, the, the, the tech companies, uh, the carriers, the truck manufacturers that are really all involved in this, it's truly a collaboration of everyone to really make it happen. You know, they're, they're, they're driving towards this, this uh, fully autonomous um, vision um, with safety as the number one priority, right? Safety for the organization, safety for the people around the truck, on the highway, safety for, for 
for everyone involved. And so I, I, I give the industry a lot of credit that they're really using that, you know, um, you know, to, to really move forward within their, their vision. I think, yeah, to answer your question, ultimately, will they be fully autonomous without anyone in the cab? Yes, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll gradually get there. Um, and, and I think your analogy, you know, with, um, you know, with the autopilot on, on the planes um, is a great analogy. Um, I, I've heard numbers that as much as 80 percent of, um, you know, traveling in an airplane and um, the, the, the driving, if, if you will, uh, about 80 percent of that is fully autonomous even today. So, mm -hmm. so the pilot's only really, you know, grabbing those controls, maybe maybe 20 percent of the time or yeah. something like that. So it's already that autonomous, you know, with the commercial air travel. And um, I, I think trucking is moving, moving ahead very quickly to get there as well. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. So we know obviously our folks that are listening and watching. Yeah. Trucking is a very heavily um, regulated industry. Yes. So how big of a hurdle? And I, we don't have to get too political. Sure. You can if you want. Yes. But how big of a hurdle do you think the federal government will be yeah. to this fully? And I, I think when I say fully, probably yeah. the same thing that you do. Yeah. Fully, as in nobody in the cab ever. Mm -hmm. uh, how how big of a hurdle do you think the federal government and maybe even to some degree the insurance industry mm -hmm. is going to be to yes. that fully autonomous? Yeah. 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 You know, I, I believe and take comfort in the fact that, you know, I think on the regulation side of things that they, like everyone else involved uh, on, on the business side of things, are, are really using safety um, as, a, as a number one priority. We're going to carefully get to autonomy, you know, and, and make sure that it's completely safe. Um, it's, it's interesting in, in different industries, but it's interesting, for example, you know, Tesla's and other, um, you know, automotive manufacturers right now have, have almost autonomous or kind of, you know, co-pilot mode, you know, in, in the vehicles today. So you can hit a couple of buttons in a lot of vehicles today and get it in autonomous mode. And you probably, you know, ridden around, um, you know, in, in your own vehicle or a friend's vehicle, you know, when it's pretty much driving itself. Um, and that's allowed, right? That's legal. That, that, that's moved, you know, you know uh, through the regulation process. And so, you know, I think like that trucks will uh, as well. And I think, you know, that an important kind of question within this conversation today and, and some of the great topics that you're bringing up um, is, uh, you know, is that going to be a hurdle? I think it, it, it won't if safety continues to drive things. And I think specifically kind of answer your question, largely, um, you know, the federal government very involved in this, but, but is, is leaving a lot of the regulation up to the, to the states. And, and allowing the states to really determine the regulation and be involved in that process within their own home states. And so some states are better than others mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, really being behind and pushing, you know, autonomy and trucking, for example. So I think that's kind of what's going on in the regulation, you know, side of, of things. Um, and I think it's important to note, too, you know, are we there yet? You know, almost as I shared, but, you know, I think it's an important question, you know, what, why do we want to get there? And I think that answers a lot of questions, you know, around this as well. I mean, it's cool. And, you know, I think we immediately kind of, um, you know, imagine, well, this is a safety thing, right? Ultimately, autonomous trucks are going to be safer, you know, on certain routes and certain scenarios, you know, than a human driver. And if that's, you know, the reason behind all this, that's a good thing, right? If, if, if we're saving lives and making trucking safer, that's a good thing. And I think that that's, you know, a big part of why this is all happening right now. Yeah. Technology is at that point now to where it can really, you know, be, be safer. And yeah. So, yeah. And, and do you think, though, that the general public, because when we say safer, yeah, I, I, I like in my heart, yes. I want to agree with yes. you on that. Yeah, but but driving, you know, even here in downtown Nashville, yeah. our traffic has just gotten worse and worse year after year. Yes, if, if I'm driving in downtown Nashville and I look yeah. over and I see an eighty thousand pound yeah. truck and there's nobody in the cab, yes. How big about maybe a, a public hurdle? Yeah. From the general public, are we going to have to get over? Yes. Forget the federal government. Yeah. But but just from the general public standpoint, to looking over and seeing nobody. I know that like you know Uber and Lyft. I know we've got self driving cars right. that that are doing that. Yes. But it's another thing when it's an eighteen wheeler. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be like a public perception or a public hurdle that we have to get over? Yeah. To as you say, talk about the safety of it because yeah. that it almost seems. Counter predictive, you know, yes. counter productive when right. we're saying, yeah, it's going to be safer, but there's nobody in the truck. Yes, yes, great point, great point. Um, my immediate thought is, as you you know shared, and as I realized, we trust technologies at thirty five thousand feet, you know, with four or five hundred other people around us right. on a plane in the skies, and, and and we're trusting every time we get a plane, as I did this morning, 
that those autonomous technologies are operating properly, right? Yeah. So if I'm trusting at that level, I have to be able to trust it on the highway, you know? Um, it, does it make me a little bit uncomfortable? For sure. I came from Dallas, Texas. Um, you know, when I got six inches on one side, you know, to the median, and six inches from that 80,000 pound truck on the other side, and I look up as I've already done, and I don't see a see driver anybody. controlling it like I typically do on a truck like that, does it make me a little nervous? And do I give them a little more room, um, you know, than I might normally? Absolutely, yeah. you know, but I'm also jumping on a plane this morning, trusting those, you know, technologies, um, you know, that, that work. But I think, you know, I think we really need to look at it, you know, for what it is, too, in terms of, um, you mentioned some of the rideshare companies. There are rideshare companies today um, that are fully autonomous that you're just jumping in, you're trusting to get to your destination in the major city. So that, that stuff is happening. I think to your point, whenever there's an accident or an incident with one of those vehicles or an incident with a Tesla or something that's like that, hear about. that's all we hear about. And people kind of go crazy about it. The reality, are we ignoring the hundreds or thousands of accidents that happen every day with human drivers, you know, yeah, and, and, and or that happen, you know, with taxi cabs or lifts that have human drivers, you know, yeah, we're a little bit more sensitive, you know, and I think news and media, I mean, we all, you know, really, really pick up on that stuff, but, but I am confident, and, and, you know, I'm someone, you know, that, like you, that, you know, this stuff didn't even exist, wasn't even a thought, you know, when I got my driver's license, you know, and so it's all very fascinating and cutting edge, but, um, I think that, that we have to trust in the technology as we almost do on an airplane, you know, today and, and know that at the end of the day, the math and the tests and the technology show that this has a quicker reaction time, you know, than, than a human possibly can. And it can predict conditions and things like that, you know, uh, to a level that we really don't have, uh, you know, the brain power to as humans. And so I guess I'm trusting, you know, in a lot of that technology. And so, you know, that safety, that trust, that technology is important. But I think we, ha we have to remember at the end of the day, too. There are some really nice advantages for the drivers themselves and for the trucking companies and the carriers. You know, there's things like efficiency, increased efficiency in production. Um, you know, autonomous, um, you know, vehicles, for example, um, they don't have limited hours, right? It doesn't, doesn't have to sleep as, as we do. Um, there's hours of service regulations in the trucking industry. Autonomous technologies, the robots don't have to abide by that. They can keep on trucking, you know, where drivers, you know, might not. That safety thing I think we talked about, you know, a little bit is, is really important. You know, reducing some of those labor costs for the carriers is 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 a, is a good thing. One of the benefits that I like most, though, and and that's the, the you know the reality in autonomous trucking. I think just you know hitting some of those you know benefits and where I kind of see things going is the fact that autonomous trucks truly will pick up a lot of the less desired routes within trucking. And so a big thing within the trucking industry, as you well know better than I do, is that you know drivers want to be at home more. You know they don't want to be on the road all the time. And so if there's an ability to supplement, you know, that with technology that allows them to be home and focus maybe on kind of those short haul routes, you know, in and around where they live and they can put a full day in and be at home, you know, uh, with their family at the end of the night. And we've got robots picking up some of these undesirable routes yeah. that they'd rather not take anyway. I think that could be a good thing, too. So I think there's some good advantages there, too, yeah. other than just taking them. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I, I, yeah. When we start talking about stuff like this, it kind of makes me feel like the old man yelling at kids to get off his lawn because yeah. I'll be honest with you, if I order an Uber and I yeah. get in and there's nobody in the driver's seat, <laughs> yeah. I'm probably getting out just as quick as I got in. For I, sure. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm that trusting quite yet, but yes. it's, it's very fascinating to, it is. Uh, to think about. Well, yeah. let, let everybody know how they can yeah. find the podcast, where, yeah. where can they find it, yeah. and where can they subscribe. Sure. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So you can find it at marketscale.com. Uh, we've got incredible shows and channels page is really kind of known within the industries nowadays as the Netflix of B2B. So go to the Netflix of B2B, marketscale.com, hit the shows and channels tab. Are we there yet? It will come up as one of hundreds of exciting shows in about 60 different industries where you can learn about some of the most cutting edge stuff happening. So please do check it out at marketscale.com. Uh, it's also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all your favorite podcast platforms that so you can find it wherever you you spend your time, but but please do check yeah. it out, and, and it's it's a lot of fun, and we cover trucking and space and uh, everything else, shipping, logistics, yeah. and, and it's it's a lot of fun. I, yeah. I would tell everybody I've, yeah. I've listened to to several episodes. Go check it out. It's a fantastic listen. It's yeah. extremely interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming by. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing uh, hearing you tomorrow. Thank you. Welcome to Nashville. Enjoy the conference, Thank and uh, let's work on that Elon Musk. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're gonna make that happen. Two thousand twenty four. Thanks for having me, Scott. Yeah. yeah. All right, so our next guest is the president of uh, recruiting operations for Transforce, uh, Craig Ferguson. So Craig manages and oversees all driver recruitment operations at Transforce, focusing on optimization, 
of the recruitment pipeline, processes, and infrastructure to create more value for Transforce customers nationwide. Specifically, he's focused on reducing time to job placement, which is extremely important. Uh, before this role, he acted as the uh, managing partner for Drive 360, 360 Logistics, one of the largest providers of talent in the transportation industry. Craig, welcome to the resource. Welcome to Nashville. Hope you're doing well. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, um, you land in Nashville, there's always excitement. But when I came into the hotel and saw the setup, for the next couple of days, it's quite impressive. Yeah. You guys went all out. So well, it's, it's yeah, with, it's, a, it's a, couple of days. a great couple of days, and uh, uh, we, we know how to party here in Nashville, apparently. So. <laughs> so the good part was, and we were talking about this um, previously, because we're you know nationwide and we have offices everywhere, we don't often get together as a team. Yeah. So we have a couple of team members here um, over the next couple of days. So it's always good to connect in yeah. person, especially when you're spread out. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. No, absolutely. Appreciate you coming on. So, so I, before we get into the important transportation <laughs> stuff, so I, I noticed in your bio, and I didn't know this when, when I was on your show a couple of weeks ago, that you actually spent 14 years in the NHL and, and professional hockey. So I'm, I'm not a, a, I follow hockey, obviously, with the National Predators in town and went to the Stanley Cup a couple years ago, but I got to know what's what position did you play? What? Sure. Tell me about life in the NHL. So I did play 14 years professionally. There was eight here in North America. I spent the last six in Europe, um, which was a much different experience. But in the NHL, I played for teams in Montreal, the Canadians, the Calgary Flames, the Florida Panthers. Um, I think the Predators actually came after me. I am that far removed from the NHL, which is not a good thing because I know it's it's their 25th anniversary. It is, it is their 25th, but we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't have to talk about that. It, yeah. Right. But I know that they have a great organization. Um, they put some good roots down in, into the community. They've got great product. Yeah. I mean, Bridgestone Arena is one of the best places to watch. Yeah. Hockey and Hockey Live, is, there's nothing like that. I, I definitely agree with that. So I, I grew up in Missouri. I was kind of a St. Louis Blues fan and then moved to Nashville 20 plus years ago. And I knew just based on, you know, cheering for the Titans and kind of how uh, passionate the city is about their sports, I knew it would take one deep run in the Stanley Cup playoffs for this town to absolutely go berserk because there is nothing better, in my opinion, and I'm a huge baseball fan, um, but there's nothing better than Stanley Cup playoff hockey. It's just, there's just something different about it that, um, it's, it's different than the World Series. It's different than than playoffs in football. There, there's just an intensity to Stanley Cup hockey that I, I don't know if it's matched by other major sports, and I'm probably going to get hate mail on that. Right. I don't have the experience in other sports, but the playoffs are, to your point, yeah. so upset. It is absolutely a war of attrition. Yeah. It's just two months of battling. You know, the winner is usually the one who just survives. So. Yeah. Um, and then you shake hands after, which is totally like <laughs> yeah. uh, any other sport, you know. Yeah. So did so, so close. Did you coming. did you get to play in the Stanley Cup playoffs? No, didn't get to do no. it. My first year with Montreal, I was in the minors and I got called up to be a black ace. Okay, it's the ones where okay, if anybody gets hurt on the main team, there's always somebody around to plug in. You right. need that in the playoffs because there's a lot of injuries. Yeah. So it was ninety two, ninety three was my first year out of college, my first year of pro. So I got to be a black ace, and they actually won the Stanley Cup, oh, which is great to watch. Yeah, I would love to have been involved in a game yeah. um, and be a part of that on the inside. But I was able to practice with the team and go through all the travel and the prep. And it's a pretty exciting time, yeah. and it's it's fast approaching another month. Oh yeah, I'm gonna we'll be right in. So hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll make another run. Well, I, listen, I could sit and talk about <laughs> yeah, sports, uh, right. so but I think we, in order to pay the bills, I think we may need yeah. to specifically talk about a little transportation stuff. So, so obviously, we're here at the Recruiting Retention Conference. Folks from all over the country have traveled into Nashville to talk about how we recruit more drivers, how do we generate more leads, and then how do we retain those drivers. So I guess I kind of want to talk to you specifically, are more leads always great? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, we live this every day. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear the breakout sessions and the speakers because they're in it as well. And to get that feedback and, and their thoughts, I think it's going to be good. But, you know, there's always this struggle at the top of the funnel. 
you know, how much is too much? Um, when should you turn off the spigot? And it really depends. Um, you know, you get that answer a lot with a lot of these questions. But, you know, more and more, it's about quality into the top of the funnel and understanding the next step in your funnel. Okay, it's great to get 10, 15, 20 drivers into the top of the funnel, but if your recruiting team is not built to handle that capacity, then it's wasted. So you really have to look at every stage of the hiring cycle yeah. and your capabilities as a team to figure out, okay, what should you be bringing into the top of the funnel? So there's no reason to overwhelm your recruiting team if you don't have to. So yeah. really be thoughtful about you know, where the candidates are coming from and the quality. The quality sure. Always you know, understanding the platform and the source of those candidates and then making adjustments based on the volume needed. Right. So, so you, you, your focus is on reducing time to job placement. So timing is obviously always extremely important in, in, in this industry in particular, and particularly when it deals with recruiting. So maybe talk about that a little bit. What are, what are, what are some advice, what are tips do you have for kind of reducing that time from when maybe that driver hits the top of the funnel to you can get them, get them plugged? Right. So we really looked at the funnel and broke it. And we've identified the different steps and we've really functionalized those steps. Really made them finite and applied resources at every stage to make sure we're optimizing each stage. So we get them into the top of the funnel and we make sure they're reacted to immediately. Um, making sure the recruiters know what's coming, know what's coming from a marketing perspective, know what they to expect at the top of the funnel so they can react quickly. And making sure there's a connection too, right? So speed to the first connection is important, but communicating the next steps in the process to the driver is also important because mm -hmm. you've got to get the processing done, you've got to get the compliance done, you've got to get the onboarding done to get them the seat. So it's not only first touch and communicating, it's really helping the driver understand, okay, this is where we are in the process. This is your next step. These are your expectations throughout. So we've really been thoughtful about the whole driver experience through the funnel and making sure we're optimizing it each step. To make sure that there's no fall off. There is right. going to be fall off. You know, in the environment with where we're in, there's always opportunities for the drivers. But making sure you make that connection um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Yeah. To be open and communicate, and if there's to set expectations, I think is important. Okay, so let, let's let's do kind of a final follow-up question here as it relates to lead. So trucking companies all the time are looking for drivers, and sometimes they've got to find them in challenging areas you know, many or somewhere along those lines, right? So when it comes to finding drivers in challenging areas, what are what are some of the things, what are some advice that you would have for those trucking companies that are looking to find those jobs that are a little challenging to fill? Of course. Um, I think one of the advantages we have at Transforce is we get to see a lot, right? We work with multiple carriers in every situation. We obviously get some of the more challenging roles to fill. Um, when we look at our inventory of jobs, there's obviously more difficult jobs to fill. And what we have to do in those situations is understand all that we have, all the tactics that we have access to, both paid and unpaid. Um, there's examples out there that we can use. Princeton, Indiana, for example, is not an easy place to find drivers. When you have an open order or you have to fill 20 seats, that's a challenge. Um, sometimes you have to move away from full applications. You have to go to a lead level. Um, and then beyond that, you might not get a full resume. You might just have an email or a phone number or an acquaintance who has a CDL. You have to work at that stage to get them into the top of the funnel so that they can fill out a full application. So relying on a certain level of lead at the top of the funnel is going to be challenging in different situations. A good job is going to be easier to get a full application and an engaged candidate than a more difficult job. Um, just understanding where the job is in comparison to other jobs in the market and where the market compares to other markets. Um, and then planning your, your marketing accordingly and your recruiting accordingly. Knowing that if you're gonna be in a difficult situation, yes, you can go out and spend, but be thoughtful about that. Yeah. Know that it's not gonna work and then you have to go to plan B. So it's always testing, adjusting, and evaluating. You'll get it eventually, um, it's just not going to be an immediate win um, when you put something in market. That's fantastic. Well, 
appreciate your uh, your time, your, your feedback today. It's great. I want to talk hockey at some point. Maybe yeah. we do that at the reception. Oh, yes, maybe we do that at the reception. But uh, I want to have you back on when Priscilla's with me. She's obviously a lot better at that this than I am. But uh, have you back on, and, and we'll we'll really dive into a lot of this and what's going on, particularly is what this year's going to look like with the, hopefully the economy rebounding. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, be very busy and doing a lot. I, I'm all for it, man. I'm all for it. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Enjoy the conference, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see each other here pretty, here pretty soon. Good luck. Thanks, well, man. Appreciate it. Scott, those were great. I, I hate, honestly, after listening to those interviews, I hate that I wasn't there, that I couldn't have sat down with um, all of those folks. Listen, is anybody funnier in the industry than Matt Beach? I don't know. I, I no, know. there's not. And I and I told him when we got done, I'm like, listen, man, we'll, we'll have you back on for a full episode for no other reason than just the pure entertainment value. I, I had to really watch the clock because I was afraid we were going to go so long just just bantering back and forth so yeah beach is fantastic and and we'll definitely have him and some of the others back on uh uh to when we and and the cool thing is is we did talk to grant about maybe trying to get an elon musk interview so we'll uh okay. you know i'm not going to promise anything but how cool would that be to to do a little elon musk so so we'll uh we'll start pinging him on social media we know he runs his own twitter account so uh we'll see what we can do <laughs> yeah that'll be cool and just remember if if you do want to register for the r and conference next year, we always open registration on October 1st. And the conference is always in February, always in Nashville. Next year's conference is February 19th through the 21st, 2025. Can you believe we're even saying that out loud? Um, and again, we are in Nashville. Next year, we'll be at the Grand Hyatt in Nashville. The website is annualrrconference.com, so you can check that out. Hey! This was great, Scott. I don't feel like I really had to do much on this episode. I kind of like that. You had the perfect episode. You did great. No foul ups, nothing. You did You did great. So, well, listen, everybody, thank you for listening to the uh, resource. If you had fun, give us a high five by leaving us a rating or a review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode of My Seriousness and Priscilla's Shenanigans. If you have any questions or feedback, share it uh, with us or hit us up on social media or email. And we'll be back with our next episode with more fun data and information to help you in your recruiting and retention game. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next month.